Okay, hi everyone, guess we're start. We might get a few more um, audience, but um, it should be fine. So welcome to today's talk, um, a conversation at an ordinary art shop, the survival kit of Aubrey in a global contemporary art ecology in China. And we're very happy to have Hu Ling with us, who is our current curator in residence. Um, so a bit about um, Easy Contemporary. My name is Dot and I work as a curator. Uh, we are the UK's only non-profit art centre specialising in presenting and platforming artists and art, pra art practices that identify with and are informed by East and Southeast Asian um, cultural backgrounds. And um, a bit about Ling. So Ling Gu is a writer, curator, translator and editor. And throughout her career, she has been a regular contributor to multiple domestic and international art publications. She recently hosted a series of art writing workshops as an educational program for university students. Ling endeavors to explore the possibilities of writing contemporary art. So she um, recently participated in the inaugural Deying Curatorial Fellowship, which she will be able to discuss further in her presentation today. Um, she has over 12 years of working experience in culture and arts communication and management, home through roles at the Rockbound Art Museum Shanghai, the British Council of China, and most recently at the Design Society in Shenzhen. She offers content interpretation and communication consultancy for multiple professional art institutions as well. Um, so, following her talk today, there will be opportunities for you to ask any questions and interact with Ling and also the um, different zines and publication that she has brought um, with her from China. Um, please feel free, feel free to um, read through and ask any questions you might have. And um, again, if you haven't noticed, there are some uh, snack and light refreshment at the kitchen counter to help yourself. Uh, we want to extend our gratitude to the British Council CTC grant for their support um, to Ling's residency with us, as well as today's event. Um, before we commence, just a quick note on logistics. The fire exit is um, right to the left of the kitchen counter, and the restrooms are just um, outside of the room you will see. And uh, if you have any questions, just ask a staff member. Um, and also, uh, we'll be taking photos and videos if you don't want to be shown I mean, any of the media um, materials, just let us know. And we hope you enjoy today's talk. And uh, on the event handout, which you see on your seat, there is a QR code which uh, linked to our survey. So if you have any feedback, we really appreciate any thoughts and um, yeah, just general um, um, feedback to our, um, our program, which will help us improve. So yeah, um, I'll give the sp stage to Lynn. Thank you, Don. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you all for coming. And um, before I start, I want to thank uh, EC Contemporary for this really, really lovely residence. I'd like to thank all the team members, uh, Xiao Wen, Dot, uh, Ying, who's not with us here now, Hannah for yeah, uh, letting people know and uh, bringing the guests in today. Um, also, as Rina, Sisu, I, I, I may miss. Uh, also, Jeff, thank you so much um, being our technical support, and Jerem. Um, yeah, thank you all the team members uh, for really providing me great support. And I find uh, Manchester quite homey uh, in a way, and I find the city full of um, serendipity. So, yeah, full of really nice surprises, and probably I will share a couple of them later. Um, but before we start, um, I also would like to thank the Ying Foundation. This is <laughs> the back. And um, yeah, because they are also like, uh, extending their support for my, for my residence here. And uh, the publication I'm going to talk about today um, is also a result from my fellowship with, uh, with the support from the Deng Foundation. And there will be a portion of kind of autobiographical information about myself in the presentation today as well. And you can see there are some things which were produced by Avery, uh, this alternative or independent art space in Shenzhen, which I'm going to talk about. So feel free to grab some and, uh, and have a look. Um, most of them are in, are in Mandarin, unfortunately, uh, so they are not bilingual yet. Uh, but those three tiny like photo things over there, they are only images. So by flipping through them, maybe you can have a sense of uh, what the Yuanling compound looks like, which is the neighborhood uh, houses the, the art space. Yeah, 
Okay, so today is my fifth day in Manchester. As I, I don't remember at all like my last trip, what I did and so on, because I didn't write anything, unfortunately. So I will definitely write something about <laughs> this residence um, to record um, my poor memories. Um, and um, the, the, the image on the left, the top, was a, <laughs> was a childish uh, mind mapping, which was a kind of practice or exercise during the fellowship. We were like, we were follow, uh, there were four of us. So it was with the Fu Yuan, Li Jia, and the, and the Brandolin. So it was like a one year and a half fellowship. And during the process, um, together with our tutor, Karen Smith, uh, who's a, a British lady, but been based in China for more than 30 years. Uh, she's a curator and also a very diligent writer. So uh, she suggested us to do this uh, war mind mapping um, exercise to help us kind of uh, further develop our writing project, which is this book I'm going to talk about. Anyway, so um, I, and yesterday I went to see um, the economics, the blockbuster show in Whitworth. Um, Xiaowen recommended it, and I find it really, really relevant to um, my discussion about this space. Although the show in Whitworth is about Whitworth as a museum and its art collection, uh, by the way, you can also circulate this zine, which is from the Whitworth Gallery, um, and this is actually a commission uh, for an artist to kind of um, uh, interpret what uh, an art collection means uh, and the economic kind of circulation or logics uh, running behind it. Um, because uh, the similarity for me is that um, when I looked into Abri, um, although it looks quite chill and comfortable and it's been running for uh, more than three years, almost four years, um, but on everyday basis, they are always at the edge of uh, uh, survival. So they're always fighting against like getting income and keep it running. Um, although it's in a very small economic scale, but still like the overall model and also the environment or the, or the, um, yeah, the ecologies as they say situate in, I think it's very much like resonates to um, the research exhibition um, as showed in uh, Whitworth. So, um, yeah, uh, same start for the introduction. Hello, I'm Ling. Um, and um, during, the, during the fellowship, it was, um, it was a one and a half year, uh, it's, it was more like a gap year for me because I, I had been working for over 12 years uh, in art institutions, and that was the opportunity for me to kind of freely explore a topic, but enter a larger theme, which was already dis, um, determined by the project. So it was the, the theme of the fellowship was exhibition making and the institutional landscape in China today. So to understand this landscape, um, uh, I was more looking at it from the perspective of uh, urbanization and modernization in China, which is still a, a very vast backdrop. Um, so um, I, was, I, I, be, I became quite familiar with Abri uh, when I was working in Shenzhen. I spent six years in Shenzhen. And during my, my, my years there, I, I got to know this space. And I started to realize how, how precious uh, its existence in Shenzhen was because Shenzhen, as um, I forgot your name, sorry, Tin. Tin, yeah, um, as Tin mentioned, it's a very um, special city. We're going to talk a, a little bit more about it later. It, it, it was basically uh, like the city part of it, the urban part of it, was basically starting from scratch from like 44 years ago. So it was a very aggressive process of urbanization um, and contemplating. Um, in, such, uh, in, in front of such a bad job, the meaning of the existence of a tiny, tiny, the space itself maybe is only 70 square meters, um, a tiny independent or alternative art space, and also constantly asking like what in independence means for them, what, what, is, what are they independent from, and 
what alternative means for them rather than alternative from the context or narrative from institutions or museums um, in such a landscape and to understand uh, like real day-to-day -day relationships they are building with the local neighborhood and the community and what they cultivated and what nutrition they relied on for them to survive and get charged um, from time to time. So um, I also noticed that um, the, the qualities or the, the, the recent histories of social life and also like everydayness, uh, quotidianness, like something very, looks like very ordinary. For example, being able to go to a dim sum place to have a breakfast or um, to be able to chat to some neighbors to solve some local building issues. And all these kind of tiny um, issues have been evolving and changing um, and how they were varied um, also influenced the day-to-day -day operation of this space. So it was a very micro, micro perspective um, based on um, uh, many times of interviewing and also on site witnessing to their different events um, that I, start, I, I, I accumulated and developed this, this project. Um, and in the process, I was also um, thinking a lot about, for example, at labor, um, because it was running by just two people and um, how they somehow exploited their own labors because they were not paid by anybody and they were not paying themselves. But then how did they support their own lives? It was because there was their family's support, there was this kind of intergenerational um, uh, love, affection and support to facilitate um, their kind of sacrifice of their own kind of everyday life quality um, and also um, other topics like value creation. So as long as they are doing many really interesting events like screening, exhibitions and so on, but how to evaluate these values because there's not so much a very consolidated system which kind of gives them always positive feedbacks um, and how different institutions, organizations, uh, top to the government, down to maybe their neighbors, neighbor lady. Um, yeah, what kind of relationships they form with various partners um, were all really interesting and kind of interwoven um, into, the, into the text. Um, so I, found, I, I was also visiting People's History Museum in Manchester and I found those, uh, some discourses about late, the, the history of uh, how workers um, talking about labor um, and protesting like their rights and so on and so forth, uh, really existing as well in today's um, art human resource market in uh, China. So um, these are basically um, kind of multiple threads. Um, I'm just quickly mapping um, before um, I start to first introduce um, myself um, uh, as um, my personal history um, through uh, different locations I had been um, and different living conditions I had been through uh, in my own life um, because I, I also included um, a very strong part of autobiographical um, um, aspect um, to kind of reflect on my own um, real life experience in talking about um, average uh, cases. So here it goes about um, the, the, the side A of uh, Ling's um, uh, experience. So she was born in 1988 in Shanghai General Hospital um, number 100 Hainin Road, Hong Kong District. The location sits in the northern side of Shanghai um, and less than one kilometer on foot from her maternal grandmother's home. Today it is known as Shanghai Red Cross Hospital slash the First People's Hospital of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Between 1988 and 1995, before she went to elementary school, she traveled often back and forth between her own home, a 10 square meter Ting Zijian, 
uh, Ting Zi Jian means uh, between floor space, together with her parents on Kunming Road, also in Hongkou District, and her maternal grandmother's home. Between 1995 and 2003, after being relocated from the Ting Zi Jian, her family moved to a social housing belonging to the Shanghai Gas Company on Qing Shi Road, Baoshan District, nearly 10 kilometers away from city center. She studied in the Sanmen Junior High School in the same area. Between 2003 and 2005, together with her mother, she moved to her mother's elder sister's home in, in Jingqiao neighborhood, Pudong District. She had to travel over one hour single way to go to Hong Kong Senior High School in Hong Kong District since her registered permanent residence placed in her maternal grandmother's home. By this time, her mother moved to live together with the younger son's, um, her grandmother moved to live together with the younger son's family in Pudong District. Um, between 2005 and 2006, in preparation for the National College entrance examination, she moved to the Baizhen vacant grandma's mother's old house together with her mother since it was close to her high school, which was located exactly opposite Shanghai General Hospital. Soon after her graduation, the high school's campus was occupied by the hospital and the high school was relocated further north to a newly built compound. Between 2006 and 2010, she, moved, uh, she traveled back and forth between the dormitory of East China University of Politics, Science and Law in Songjiang University town, Songjiang district, and a rented apartment, monthly rent uh, 2,000 RMB, which is around 200 pounds now, in Xu Jiahui area, Xu Hui district. It was a two-hour journey one way. She was simultaneously studying and working part-time. Between 2010 and 2015, she lived in the area nearby M50, one of the most important contemporary art districts in Shanghai. She moved three times to different apartments, average monthly rent 5,500 RMB, but remained in the same area. Between the end of 2015 and 2022, she lived in rented apartment, monthly rent, also 5,500 RMB, and later a social housing for talents, monthly rent 2,200 RMB in Shekou, Nanshan District, Shenzhen. In 2023, she lives in her own home in North Xujing neighborhood, Qingpu District, Shanghai. This is a social housing from domestic distribution to her mother and herself after the demolition, after the demolition of her maternal grandmother's house on Hainin Road. Hong Kong district. So this was my uh, place <laughs> autobiography and uh, somehow the relationship between uh, the ownership of a place really influences how much rights one has over a space. For example, um, maybe around 2000 to 2010, um, Shanghai and also other major cities saw uh, emergence of some small scale alternative spaces appeared but they usually rented spaces. So they had to maybe constantly move or had to obey a certain um, unequal like requirements from their landlords to cope with certain things that they didn't really have the full right to control. Um, and this relationship between individual and, and place um, becomes really a core um, issue for me to look into um, during my um, yeah, research about um, the survival kit of Avery. Um, and when we talk about survival, we always also refer to um, maybe kind of Darwinist um, logic, like if you are stronger, if you can cope better with the, um, the overall kind of marketing mainstream dominance logics and you can live b better or survive better and you can get more resources and you can lead a better thing but um, somehow this doesn't work in the sense or it was like both subjective and objective that the team wanted to keep a very clear distance from the mainstream contemporary art world in China um, and I will go into some more details. So they were also trying to um, explore 
a kind of alternative path that they don't necessarily need to become bigger and stronger, but still they can live their own life um, as a little tree. And tree is uh, also a metaphor really important and reflected in their name, and I'm going to talk about them later. So this is a um, paragraph um, I quoted also um, in the book. Um, it was written by uh, Duan Yifu uh, in 1977. Probably most of you have read this book. It's called Space and Place, the Perspective of, of Experience. It's a very um, uh, well-known um, cultural geographical uh, publication. Um, I'm going to read uh, the English. The Chinese is a very good translation. Um, so um, they reflect quite well each other. Uh, so knowing a place clearly takes time. It is a subconscious kind of knowing. Uh, in time, we become familiar with a place, which means that we can take more and more of it for granted. In time, a new house uh, ceases to make little demands on our attention. It is as comfortable and an obtrusive as an old pair of slippers. Um, <laughs> in a way, um, when, uh, because in the introduction of today's event, uh, there was this uh, phrase, I didn't, I, I think I didn't write it, but EC Contemporary rephrased it into this phrase, and I find it really interesting. It's called long-term targeted, um, and I think it's a really precise um, phrase um, that they want to, say, say they pursue longevity, but they don't necessarily pursue a brand prosperity for longevity. And the understanding of the existence of long-term um, embeds in this old pair of sleeper sense. Um, and this, goes, this image probably goes very well with an old pair of sleeper. <laughs> These are like plastic chairs you can often see in Da Pai Dong and street uh, snack uh, restaurants. Um, and this uh, pack, um, this white uh, plastic foam package, which is often used for he fan, uh, it's like takeaway uh, food, especially for like low paid workers, especially construction workers. And they use this very easy, very accessible material and resources. And probably you all know like in China, Taobao is really the main source platform to, to provide any materials for installation of exhibitions and for artistic production. Anyway, but this was a local resource and they use it to pack um, these self-publication things um, as, a, uh, as a series. So this was a display for their three-year anniversary exhibition in Zhi Museum, which is also a corporate funded museum uh, located far um, North uh, West. Um, I've got a map later on and I will show you where it is. So um, here is there's a, a paragraph uh, introducing their self-publication practices uh, when they participated in um, an exhibition in Dolwen Museum uh, of Modern Art in Shanghai. Um, the title of the show was, uh, I'd, I'm glad to print this sentence. Um, it's a show curated by Shi Han Tao talked about um, uh, self-printing or self-publication as um, an alternative uh, practice, artistic practice uh, for art communities in China. Um, and uh, this paragraph uh, is written to introduce um, the different series of self-publication for Abri. So, um, drifting plan. Um, and uh, our wandering plan, uh, wandering plan is the name I'm going to use, and zinc production plan locate, um, is, uh, are two main parts of Abre zincs. Um, uh, they use uh, the convenient and fast way of zinc making to uh, create a nearby art in Shenzhen, um, backed by the former printing based Bagua Lin. Um, the area they are located in is very nearby to um, an area called the Bagua Ling, which was um, a, a very important base of printing factories, including Aturong, which is Yachang, um, uh, to 
very easily and quickly print anything you want and you can order today and you get it in the afternoon or the day after. Or you can just walk in the printing studio and get it immediately. Um, Wandering Plan is an outward observation eye uh, leading participants to observe the surrounding daily life through photography and solidifying the image memory in zine. Zines are inward reflections uh, organizing uh, Abri's art, art practice. Um, these were written by them. It was not written by me, so it's a little bit like mechanical English. At the same time, the on-site artworks, um, which refers to the display in the Dolor Museum, organize, um, uh, are either created in the Yuanling neighborhood or are related to the space where Abri is located through its connections. Uh, these are all important pieces of evidence of Abri's relationship with the city. Uh, Abri does not pursue a serious artistic identity, but always seeks people with the same passion, hoping to start from small communities through art and have more dialogues with the world. Uh, this was from them. So um, this is the, uh, the street where a very quiet, kind of inner, both inner and outer street uh, in Yuanlin uh, neighborhood where uh, Abri locates. And this, uh, this where the um, red dot lamp locates where the entrance is. And you can see it, um, <laughs> there is a nickname for their entrance called the Shui Lian Dong. Uh, <laughs> water dripping cave because uh, the, the water from the upstairs con air conditioners would always drip down <laughs> during summer and uh, the neighbors ne always refused to repair and <laughs> so they have this water dripping thing in front of the entrance and, and yeah, this was it. Um, and the list here are all the things, they, all the activities um, they organize. And, uh, uh, and an ordinary art shop is uh, a phrase I, I, I created to name them in the sense that um, it could be like a bubble tea shop or any shop that you know you just pass by every day and you can work in, work out with no pressure. So it's not like if you want to work in a gallery or a serious art space, you would kind of prepare yourself or it's sometimes kind of, it's kind of targeted journey, like, okay, I know I will go to this place, but they want it to be a part of the neighborhood in the sense that it's like a bubble tea shop or a local bookstore or a local uh, dessert shop or whatsoever. So although they are not selling any very popular commodities, but the experience is comparable um, to a shop. And, um, it opened in uh, 2019, January 18th. It was actually the birthday of one of the co-founders, um, but it was not because it was his birthday, so it was chosen, but it was because it was a very fortunate day for Chaoshan people. Um, <laughs> because the other uh, co-founder of this space was from Chaoshan community, and um, they have to calculate days um, <laughs> to decide what activities they would do. For example, if um, a couple plan to get married, they would look at this special calendar and see which day would suit or be fortunate for their marriage. Um, and some days are more fortunate than the, than the others. Um, the, leverage, the level of fortune is different. Um, and they are, to be more specific, maybe it also comes with like the five elements and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit complicated. We're not going to go into that. But this kind of mindset, this kind of mind mentality also influences. So for example, if we look at the timeline of their, activ of their activities, the element of this kind of fortune date um, also influence uh, their program planning. Um, and um, their name, um, actually, uh, arbre is a French word, uh, means uh, tree. So it's, it's a very interesting name and I will talk a, a little bit more about the name later. Um, so Abri is a normal, ordinary, independent art space that seeks to integrate art into everyday life in a sincere and stress-free way. 
through activities such as exhibitions, workshops, so on and so forth, it is committed to spreading the artistic atmosphere within the community and building an artistic environment, providing visitors with an experience from the nearby. So um, earlier on today, I was in a online kind of digital community discussion and the people were talking about this uh, nearby concept. So I'm going to quickly introduce this concept um, in case not all, all of you are familiar with it. Um, the nearby in Chinese is Fu Jing, um, has become a very well known and popular concept proposed by uh, uh, Biao Xiang, Xiang Biao, uh, an established anthropologist. In his article, The Nearby A Scope of Seeing, which was published in Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art uh, in 2021, he used the nearby as a central scope. He wrote, the nearby is a lived space where one encounters people with diverse backgrounds on a regular basis. The nearby brings different positions into one view, thus constituting a scope of seeing. Such a scope enables nuanced understanding of reality and facil facilitates new social relations and actions. The nearby could form a line of resistance against the power of the state, capital and technology such as turning local communities into units of administrative control and value extraction. This article calls for a first mile movement in which artists, researchers and activists work together to help facilitate citizens with the construction of their nearby as a basis for reflecting upon life experiences, testing grand ideologies and engaging in public discussions. First mile movement is a counter uh, term invented counter against uh, last mile movement. Last mile movement, Zui Hou Yi Gong Li, was also a very popular economic term invented by different capitals and corporates, um, for example, delivery services or shared bike business or um, metro constructions, um, so that they would reach the last mile um, of people's uh, living neighborhoods. And the first mile, um, so that's kind of the, 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 the background for why Xiang Biao chose uh, this, this phrase. Um, this is the, so this is the logo of Aubrey and uh, it, it resembles like a little zing, but also resembles like a little house, the facade of a little house. Um, uh, if you scan the QR code, you, you will have uh, its WeChat account. Um, and this is the floor plan of the space. Um, so originally it was, it was running um, a, a small cafe um, uh, with a bar uh, near the window, uh, which is by the street. Um, and they have their own kind of little shop, which sells different things, not only things produced by themselves, but also things in collaboration with different artists. Uh, in the center, they have uh, exhibition hall, um, and the sunlight room is, off, is also often used for exhibitions. Uh, they use their toilet for displaying art as well. Um, actually, it's quite nice <laughs> if you see artworks in toilet. Um, and uh, they've got a reading room uh, where they have their own archives and, uh, and a small library, and in the back, uh, they've got their office and uh, storage. So there's also a back gate um, which is uh, located in, in their office and storage, um, which uh, connects to the inner part of the neighborhood. So that the space is itself is actually a passage uh, that you can... So this was also the original structure that uh, when, when such kind of urban village, social housing neighborhood was designed, uh, that the connectivity of uh, between different houses were really, really strong. So um, you can always go to different houses, you can go to different parts, um, and the back door and the front door were both used um, quite frequently. Um, is Aubrey a self-sustaining institution? Um, yes and no. At this moment, the founders make money from external territorial and activity projects uh, to subsidize, uh, subsidize the cost of the space operation. This means the space does not make money. However, Abri presents external projects and therefore brings 
in income that is funneled back into the space. Um, how ordinary is it? Um, it exists like a community bubble tea shop in today's world. Uh, being extraordinary is always expected. In the meantime, the ordinary has been despised. However, when everyday life consists of fierce competition and breathless endeavors, an ordinary place such as Abri is somehow is somewhere we can take a break and relax a little. It becomes a luxury in the sense that there is still room for freestyling and unforeseen possibilities. It offers a home-like atmosphere that allows the guests to not act in a purpose-driven way. An alternative world for, uh, world for ord ordinary is normal, which usually describes the majority, but in striving to be an ordinary outside, Abri becomes at the same time a minority. Um, this is uh, the Yuanling uh, neighborhood I, sp I have been talking about. Um, the little red bubble is where Abri locates, and as you can see, the, it's, a, it's very much a quite precise square, um, which, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the range of the neighborhood. I'm going to introduce the neighborhood with um, some uh, quite specific um, uh, statistics. So, um, completed in 1984, Yuanling neighborhood is the earliest and the largest welfare housing community for civil servants in Shenzhen with a total of 112 buildings, most of which are multi-story um, multi residences with an average of seven floors. Yuanling residential district also owns multiple school district houses. So school district houses is really important, which are houses within a school district in China that allow students free admission to the nearest school. So this, this condition makes the, all these school district residences really, really valuable. Um, they, are highly com they are highly scarce um, in the property uh, real, real estate market um, in most of the major cities in China. Students who take advantage of school district houses can enter the nearest school without taking exams. Among them, Buildings 1 to 62 are allocated to Yuanling Primary School and buildings 33 to 112 are allocated to Yuanling Foreign Language Primary School and Yuanling Experimental Primary School. There are also five 31-story high-rise residential buildings in Yuanling which are allocated to Yuanling Foreign Language Primary School. Of the 32-story high-rise residential buildings in Yuanling, uh, East Garden, three are allocated to Yuanling Experimental Primary School. Um, Yuanlong Garden is the la latest high-rise residential building in Yuanling, consisting of two buildings, including the Yuanhen Pavilion with 32 floors and the Lijian Pavilion with 28 floors. So that's basically what are the buildings located in this square. And uh, here I selected some really nice uh, photos of the compound. Uh, Ting is probably very familiar with all these big panya trees um, and almost like smelly the humidity in the air. Um, it's a very wet and a very hot city because it's just so every time when Shenzheners introduce the city to, 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 to people who are not really familiar with the cities in China they will say Shenzhen is the city which is next to Hong Kong. So that's immediately gives the idea of where it is and, and its relationship with the overall Pearl River Delta and now the greater uh, Bay Area. Um, and here we, ha we see this um, old lady resting um, underneath this uh, big banyan tree. Um, this local community is playing uh, different uh, table games. Um, and because of there are like different la levels of uh, of the of different buildings, so so the compound often look like a libraries. And also between the different compounds and buildings that I was introducing briefly, um, they are kind of separated but also connected all the time. So you can't really tell like where 
one building finishes and the other starts. So um, it's all intertwined with very tiny lands and uh, um, inner streets and different yards and, uh, and uh, playgrounds. Um, here is a, just an interesting image to show like um, it was uh, artwork uh, done by Zhang Yongji, who's a Beijing-based uh, moving image artist. Um, and this piece is called the Scan Yuanling. Um, so these are only screenshots of this video. And when it was displayed, he used this industrial um, uh, enlarger mirror um, to uh, facilitate the viewers to see through the mirror uh, into, the, into his video. Um, and in the video, these are just like screenshots, but basically you probably would guess um, that he's using his body to scan out the images of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, a video recording um, of the front part of the Aubrey space um, uh, uh, to visualize a very direct relationship between an individual's body and uh, a local place. Um, so to, uh, to enlarge a little bit the scope of our discussion here, for those who are not familiar with what Shenzhen actually is as a city, I prepared a two minutes uh, trailer, which was made by um, Wyatt. Let me find my mouse, where's my mouse? Okay, here. Um, uh, it was, uh, um, it was made in 2016, and in total, it has a one-hour documentary movie. If you go to YouTube and type Wyatt Shenzhen, you would find a full-length movie. But here, I'm just showing you a trailer to give you an idea of what kind of city uh, Shenzhen is in the dominant sense. <laughs> the West has of Shenzhen, a decade ago when I first came, it was very skewed, right? It was like Shenzhen is Foxconn, there's child labor, people throw themselves off buildings, they only make iPhones. They'll just sort of dismiss it and say, yeah, I know Shenzhen, I read about that in the book. That's just not the case, there's so much to offer. And the cool thing is that in this particular city, everything revolves around electronics and tech and building hardware. Shenzhen's all about speed. I mean, you know, you try doing something in the UK, it'll take you around a month. Here you can do it in a couple of days. The energy flow inside, you feel you can tap into the power. You can reuse the supply chains for whatever you want to create. In almost people's this we to the we to In almost people don't realize that there's at least 26% of the technology for Silicon Valley actually comes from Shenzhen. Shenzhen is creating more millionaires than any other city. In China. When China started to open up in the late 80s, global outsourcing continued to grow. The base in Shenzhen becoming bigger and bigger. From 300,000 to 10 million, no cities in the history of human civilization as we know that was able to do this. So you can see like down there, there's a person there with a, uh, what looks like a pile of trash, but if you look closely, it's just that they're, they're going through mobile phones and stripping out parts from them. It's like shucking corn almost. It is something that we really need more exchanges and more dialogues between China and the rest of the world. Because we are a little behind, I think, in, uh, in really grasping what is happening here. We have an idea walking to China, and the chances are we have half a million people thinking of the same thing. It's all about who make it happen first. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a more dominant Shenzhener than I am. <laughs> um, okay. uh, where is my presentation? <laughs> Um, so, 
yeah, this gives an idea, but actually the whole really like Disneyland of oh, every technology celebrated in Shenzhen, uh, it's really generating millions, millions every year, already changed as we know um, because of the trading war between US and China and also because of like so many things have changed, the pandemic. So the Huaqiang Bay area, the North Huaqiang area, where they were featuring like, there so, so were these two um, guys taking the elevator and looking at this really wonderland of uh, all electronics. Most of those buildings in, in Huaqiang Bay now are filled with uh, cosmetics. Um, the whole industry has changed and the whole neighborhood uh, landscape have changed as well. So um, I guess Shenzhen is also like in the growing very rapid and also huge scale changes on, in regards of its industrial development. Um, this is also an interesting kind of comparison uh, given my uh, working experience with, uh, with China Merchants Group. Um, it was the initiator of a new culture hub uh, which opened to the public in 2017 called the Design Society. Um, this project was a state owning uh, quite a senior level project, uh, which was uh, at the beginning, the contract was signed by Li Keqiang, uh, the former prime minister in China, as well as uh, the prime minister in the UK, um, because the project was co-initiated together with the VNA, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, um, as a, a five-year uh, partnership. So uh, this is where that project, the Design Society project, so in comparison to, to Avery, which is a 70 square meter space, uh, this huge uh, brand new cultural hub uh, was 70,000 square meters, um, taking the land of uh, 16,000 square meters um, in the western coast of Shenzhen. Uh, it was just in the tip of the Shekou uh, Peninsula. Um, so, Today, the location is really, really wonderful. And the, the two photos down here, are uh, how the place looks like and the, the, the building in the middle looks like a telescope is actually um, the, the, the building. Um, and the, building's ne the building has its own name called Sea World Culture and Art Center. Um, but the two photos above was how it looked like in 1979. That's what was just... Um, how it looked like. Um, and um, what's interesting was also that, uh, as an anecdote, uh, this explosive uh, side uh, photo in the middle was a retaken photo, uh, not, not from the site, um, but from uh, maybe um, 20 years later, when they were telling this story about how Shekou was the test tube for the China's opening and the reform and how it kind of uh, primed the whole Shenzhen city um, became the really forefront um, of uh, experimental marketing economy and everything, internationalization, modernization, um, a copy of Hong Kong um, in Shekou. Um, when they were telling these stories, uh, they means uh, China Merchants Group, um, which was both a company as well as a regional governance. Um, um, so, so wanted to make it more impactful. Um, so the original documentary photo, as you could see, was less impactful for them. Um, so they, they, they did an explosion and um, used a newer photo to claim that this was how it looked like. A bomb which changed the China. A bomb um, which uh, uh, changed the mountain into lands, into ports, into pier, into new cities. Um, a bomb which uh, changed the relationship between the ocean and the mountain that a brand new wonderful city emerged <laughs> from nowhere. Um, and this uh, like la legendary level of uh, city inventing is used uh, across uh, multiple state-owning corporates in Shenzhen. It's not only China Merchants Group. OCT, uh, 
and uh, Huawei, Huawei, um, many other uh, companies using similar uh, grandeur narrative um, to show their relationship, their prosperity uh, with this invention of a city. Um, and um, for these large scale corporates, a culture hub like design society or um, any other contemporary art institutions um, often sits as a kind of pet project um, that they are totally dependent on the finance and support from these uh, real estate uh, or um, enterprises uh, companies um, to, um, to, to, to make this uh, more like parasite um, of a business entity. Um, and this was actually, as we know, what happened um, that OCT um, terminals completely changed and transformed now into cultural uh, management companies rather than uh, serious art institutions after um, 14 years of, uh, of development and, and operation. Um, this is an overall map of the activities. Um, Avery actually spreads all over Shenzhen. So although they have this small space, but uh, they are collaborating with different cultural entities and partners. Um, Jin Museum, uh, where they had their three-year uh, anniversary exhibition, uh, uh, is the north uh, uh, west uh, sits in the northwest side. Uh, I have a, a English version of map, but um, it's not ready for now. Um, and they are also collaborating, for example, with Pingshan Museum, um, which sits in the east. Um, it was a relevantly new government-owned museum by the Pingshan district. Um, and um, Abri was also offering the wandering plan, like photo zine activities for them. So by collaborating with um, different partners and uh, in the entities, they were able to generate a modest income to kind of um, feed back to the cost of their rental um, and uh, some other material costs for the running of uh, their programs. Um, it's interesting that um, when, uh, when I was uh, reading a, a book called How to Think Like an Anthropologist, um, it mentioned, the book mentioned that uh, the English word uh, culture um, uh, shares uh, the same root, uh, for example, in cultivation, agriculture, horticulture, um, it means a, a grounding or a planting in a specific place and time. Um, so this relationship of how culture grew um, in relation to a specific uh, place or ground um, is lies in the center of uh, uh, anthropology. Um, but today, um, I think uh, the understanding of a single place um, always lies in the kind of multi-layered uh, cultures which go across uh, geography uh, uh, and uh, different time period. So um, this sounds a little bit abstract. For example, um, in uh, Pingshan, uh, although it's a brand new museum, but it's just next to uh, Da Xu, Da Peng Suo Chen, which was a town can trace back to Tang Dynasty. Um, when I mean the, plural, the plurality of uh, different historical periods and time, is that you can always see the traces from different time and places which are concentrated uh, in one single uh, location or space. Um, so this is the complex grounding or environment, Turang, um, Earth, for Abri, this little tree, um, to grow and to try to survive and continue to grow. Um, and I'm using these, Im these interesting images which refer to different projects, um, and they all share the form of a tree, um, but coming from different contexts. So the left one is a really interesting Banya tree, who obviously um, have uh, uh, This was a project done by Shu Chu Tian, um, a, a Changsha, uh, originally come from Changsha, and uh, 
She also did a residence here in EC Contemporary. Uh, she did a residence with uh, Aubrey, uh, spending, um, uh, I think, a month or so uh, in the Yuanling compound, and uh, she has this idea to, yeah, transform a tree into a, uh, maybe uh, a witch. <laughs> and uh, uh, this, this was actually um, uh, facilitated or being, in, being enabled through negotiation with the local Jiedaoban uh, sub-district office um, because this tree didn't obviously belong to Abri but belonged to a local street park which was managed and running by the sub-district office. But by then, um, because Abri formed a healthy and a positive relationship with the office, uh, so they were able to negotiate that um, they can actually um, have certain collaborations that letting some so-called public art um, enter into public spaces uh, in Yuanling neighborhood. Um, and the one in the middle was a uh, work from uh, uh, Yang Mingfeng, uh, also a Shenzhen-based artist, and he has a long research project about reclaim the land in Shenzhen. <coughs> Because along the Shenzhen coast, um, uh, there are almost nowhere which has not disclaimed the land. So the whole, almost the whole coastal um, area in Shenzhen will all uh, claim the land, uh, meaning land feeling. Um, so uh, this was uh, a fake. Uh, uh, Zhonglu Shu, um, uh, uh, the type of tree often seen in coastal areas and cities, um, together with a ruler in the back, which shows an official uh, uh, standard, a uh, national standard um, of sea levels, testing sea levels. And it becomes a kind of permanent uh, collection of abri in front of their entrance. And the one in the right is the tree being moved, obviously. Uh, it's a Gui Hua Shu um, Osmetasus tree. And it was selected for a public art project uh, uh, belonging to an uh, overall larger city uh, multimedia art festival called the Glow Shenzhen. Um, and this was, um, the tree was a part of uh, an art installation created by Ennis. Uh, in a, a Melbourne uh, Australian art, art, artist group, um, which Avery became their curatorial assistant in order to facilitate their collaboration and uh, landing of their projects uh, domestically. Um, so they all, they are all three trees, but coming from totally different contexts, um, all related to um, Avery's uh, programming. Okay, so um, uh, the book is still under construction. Um, I've finished the text, but we are still going through the layout. Um, hopefully, I will be able to share with you the copies or digital copies when it's finished. Um, before we end today's uh, 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 program, um, uh, I'd like to propose a participatory script reading um, that I selected a part of, of my writing because uh, the writing took the form of chatting. So when you go through the text, um, it's like going through a movie or a script, a script play. Um, there are four characters, um, there are mainly four characters, and through their conversations, um, the readers would explore um, most of the um, or even more topics I've touched upon briefly today. Um, so, yeah, apart the sets, um, the four main characters are um, A Mao, uh, who's a freelancer based in Shenzhen, and Ling, who's a De Ying fellow, uh, a researcher, and they're collaborating, writing a book about Avery. And uh, Shen and Vao, um, these two persons are the co-founders of uh, this art space. So um, it's not long. Um, it probably takes um, 15 minutes. Um, so uh, we've already prepared, but if 
if anyone from the guests would like to volunteer reading one rose part, um, you are more than welcome to join us. And we will do this small script reading here now. Okay, so um, we're going to introduce ourselves before we start the reading. Um, Jerem is Shen, so she's one of the co-founders for Avery, and Ting is Val, um, the other co-founder, um, and Danny is uh, Amal, and uh, I'm Ling. Okay, yeah, let's go. <coughs> this inspiration bias club, how is it? I'm curious. Um, so Bob, the founder of uh, this Inspiration Buyers Club, designed many mechanisms to intentionally cultivate Inspiration Buyers Club members' communities. I understand it as a motivational instrument to empower individuals. For example, he established an online amateur company Inspiration Board, where everyone can propose their own ideas for starting up some creative small business. And then he will organize inspiration and entrepreneurship seminars and share some of the latest creative tools on all information websites, some fun apps, etc. It's a moderated in intra company, intra community communication network. Do you think we are more hardworking offline and weaker online? I just really can't have an online identity. I think an online identity is a matter of personal design for expressions. Anything that might have been posted in the past was what I want to do, what I do, but now, when you don't want to expose yourself so much, you won't post these things. We also wanted to better cultivate our digital community. But the thing is, neither Shane or myself are anywhere close to being active online. Our chat groups are really quiet most of the time. We only send in events or exhibition announcements, that's it. I'm, I'm really talkative offline, you know. <laughs> Maybe you can hire <laughs> AI to do the PR. For example, they also have a bot app application that collects what you recently have doubts about or what you want to share, and then gathers them into a newsletter and sends it automatically to everyone. This creates a sense of initiative and rhythm and creates opportunities for communication among the members. This is consistent with Bob's mission to support creators. Maybe a large portion of our guests or customers are not creators themselves. I guess it's about it's more about the or, or it's more about the accommodation. Like me, I learned exhibition installation through helping around at Arbor. I'm apprentice, and Val is my master. Ha ha ha. That's good for you. What I refer to as UGC, user-generated content, something like the open call you do with Aubrey Housing Estate. Um, the photo here we see is actually the opening one of the opening ceremony of one episode of uh, Aubrey Housing Estate, which is an open call exhibition. They borrowed um, the format and idea of real estate um, uh, property sales, um, like you have different um, models of uh, houses and you would sell them in different, uh, you would display them in different model housing um, and they use, uh, they borrow this format to, to open call and uh, recruiting um, artists um, and most of these artists, uh, participating artists didn't study art so they, most of them are also like outsiders or, or amateurs but this Open core exhibition gave them an, an opportunity to create an artwork and also join an exhibition. And they also borrowed, obviously, the ritual, uh, the ceremony often used by real estate companies uh, when they celebrate the opening of uh, Taipan. Yeah, when they celebrate an opening of a uh, uh, property. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, and the residencies. Uh, with the Inspiration Buyers Club, uh, Bob contributes one third of the content. Uh, he may post something he created or saw, and then two thirds are actually left to the more than 250 members to contribute. It seems that some of these members are first tier and second tier members, and those who are more active will lead the others. It may be those who take the initiative to generate content, and those who take that initiative tend to open the microphone and actively share. 
those people may become intra-community KOLs, uh, key opinion leaders, in a certain field. For example, if someone in a group is good at cooking, he or she will take the lead in the cooking-related topic. Then, with the involvement of everyone, the group will gradually develop a richness. Instead of treating Bob as the sole core of cohesion, everyone can be attracted to each other and create interrelationships like satellites. I know that new members of the club are usually friends of its old members. For example, today, after listening to you advocate for it, I'm interested to join now. Even though I already tried a couple of their free events online, I somehow never made up my mind to actually pay for the membership and join it officially. Yeah, right. Uh, many of their activities are open to non-members as well. But the underlying mechanism is that each member can bring a newcomer. In many cases, the sense of belonging for members also, come, also comes from this, like through friendship. That is, they feel that they are making contributions to the organization. Membership is also an issue. We too uh, launch a membership program at Arbrit, but we struggle to define what part should be member only, therefore pay content. Fundamentally, what is the value of membership? Yeah, in addition to what is made accessible to the members, there is also a more targeted sense of social satisfaction, such as being with a group of like-minded people. Regarding the pricing of the annual fee, it's roughly a cup of coffee per month. Um, there are new members who join almost every day, and accordingly, there are old members uh, who stop renewing their memberships. In general, the annual income is enough for him, for Bob, to support himself comfortably. I'm in the tele Telegram chat group, uh, which circulates news about members in the club. Bob has set up a bot on Telegram that automatically publishes a profile about newly registered members in this chat group. I see new members coming in every day, and I feel it's somehow rewarding for me. This, this in itself is also a confirmation of value. These things are little mechanisms, little stimuli. You have to keep giving people, uh, giving um, everyone some positive stimulation. Don't forget I was one of the first subscribers of Wang Yin's Bo Wu Zhi. The main reason I subscribed was that they released members' newsletters. Yeah, Wang Ying uh, is uh, a, a, a quite uh, famous one of the KOLs for uh, Mandarin podcasts in China. Uh, and Bo Wu Zhi was the, uh, was the name of one of the key uh, podcasts she's running. I speculate that both Bob and Wang Ying econ economized to avoid running short of financial support which means they don't pursue rapidly developing their platforms. Wan Ying once stated in our board that chat, chat, groups, groups. chat group that she doesn't really look for a continuous increase of members. Instead, the current scale is enough as long as the old members continue to renew. She said that she has no energy to maintain more people if the scale of the community becomes bigger. Yeah, in reference to what Val said about the members' newsletter, I think running a community like this requires the ability of the owners or operators to acquire and produce new knowledge constantly. As for the members, there is also the sweetness of feeling that they have learned something new. For example, I joined a recent pod jam uh, co-organized by the Inspiration Bias Club. Many participants who used to know nothing about how to make a podcast but had an interest in it can now learn to manage it themselves and they can also collaborate with new acquaintances or invite old friends in the creation of it. The most essential problem for Aber is the uh, conversation the customer groups discussed earlier. Because you're mainly offline, the, this physical space itself needs traffic to convert online users, subscribers, and followers to offline visitors, customers, and guests, or the conversation can be two-way. It's a bit like a coffee shop. Usually their official social media account doesn't post much because they also have strong offline demand, but at the same time the coffee owner's social media account could bring some traffic. Like we mentioned before, most of our guests are our lover or only passerbys uh, passer and not professionals. We don't want to make it solely professional and thus feeling distant to passerby. For me, I hope the value of Arbor is to create a place that lets young artists make mistakes. 
they can experiment with something new here, sometimes without knowing exactly how things will turn out to be. Yeah, in recent Zhang Qi's text about his obse observation on the roundabout plan residence, he mentioned how the other four artists in the residency could share different or similar problems they encounter during the process of art making and distress them together. It's interesting that there are both local and non-local artists joining it. The hybridity of regions or contexts is intriguing for the artists. I'm curious to make new friends and look to look for new possibilities. It's the same with how we curated the Art Tins, a renowned enterprise known for its high quality art catalog and publication printing. It also operates a library and art center exclusively for paid members residency. Although printmaking is the theme of art and residency, we didn't limit ourselves to artists who only studied that medium. Instead, we opened it to everyone who may take printmaking as a way of thinking or a kind of resource for their own practices. There is another printmaking workshop in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen. The pay for the workshop helps to compensate us a little bit. The residency is only a part of a larger project, including an exhibition and publication based on the donation of Sun. Shenzhen University print professor Sui Cheng's collection of prints. We brought the artists to visit the China Guanlan original printmaking base and the local Guanlan art village too. Yeah, it was so far away, but two of the artists really spent a lot of time in Guanlan and Archon in order to familiarize themselves with printmaking. They became quite familiar with it by the end of the residency. And Zheng Ying, one of the artists, was selling some of her print pieces and Bon Jo Art Book Fair in Artens booth shortly after. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I chose this part because um, uh, the theme for today's event was also related to digital community building. Um, but the other topics I mentioned uh, can be found in more details with the publication. In a way, uh, the book uh, has kind of like two levels. So of course it talks about Abri, but it also borrows the everyday activity happens in Abri because people often go to Abri and just sit in and have a drink and then they start to chat just like how we did. And they would sometimes talk about quite serious topics. Um, so during the conversation, during the chat, um, these four, four rows, they don't necessarily only talk about what's related to Aubrey, but in a wider kind of ecology or any issues they find interesting or concern um, to them in relation to the contemporary art uh, industry. Um, so in that way, uh, the text, um, uses Abri as a space, as a place, to invite the rows to sit in, and then they, they do things, just like in the real life, people would go to Abri and just do things. Yeah, so that's my sharing, and we can have a free chat now, and I have also a couple of other pages, and maybe we, I can share it during our, yeah, conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.